It's not going to fit. I'm going to just zoom all the way out for this one. Today, folks, we're looking at something a little bit different than the type of quadcopter that I usually fly as my daily driver. I love to fly five inch freestyle quads, but there's a whole lot of other stuff out there, uh, including this. This is the iFlight Chimera 7 Pro. And this is going to be interesting for a couple different reasons. Number one, because it's a seven inch quadcopter. So we're going to look at the differences between the way five inch and seven inch fly and think about what might make you want to choose a seven inch over a five inch or something else. But also because this is one of iFlight's new generation of frames. They've updated their whole frame lineup, mostly to be able to carry the new DJI 03 Air unit. And we'll take a look at the special changes they made to accommodate that. But we'll also just take a look at the ways in which iFlight is trying to be more than just a typical FPV hobby company and a little bit more like a consumer products company. And whether that's actually a good thing, it's got to be a good thing, right? I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. I've got a prop on wrong. I have screwed up. I put the props on wrong, so I'm gonna go fix that. Uh, so we're gonna start this flight test with a demonstration of the kind of thing that a seven, seven and a half inch class quadcopter is good at, and that is smooth cruising. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna fly straight without moving the throttle and I'm gonna raise the throttle slowly and we can look for vibrations at any throttle position. There's full throttle and we'll come back down again. And I wasn't moving the sticks at all through any of that. So any vibra vibration that we see or anything like that we uh, know is because of the motors or the frame design. And of course, if it's smooth, then that's a good indication of the quality of this quad. I don't know yet. I haven't looked at it. I'm just looking in the, I didn't see anything in the goggles. In this style of flying, uh, how much flight time will you get? Well, I am using a 3000 milliamp hour lithium polymer battery. And the best way to fly for long flight time is to use a lithium ion battery, uh, like an 18650 cell. Radiomaster has a 6000 milliamp hour lithium ion you can fly this guy with. It's gonna be a little less nimble than it is here, although as you'll see in a little bit, it's not that nimble just cause it's a seven inch. But uh, I get about 10 or 12 minutes of flight off of this. A lithium ion would go significantly further because it can go to a lower voltage. The first thing I notice about the iFlight Chimera 7 is that it doesn't look like a typical FPV quadcopter usually looks. It continues the trend that started with the iFlight Evoque of putting side plates on the quad. And there's some argument that these side plates help protect against the ingress of dirt and dust. For example, here is my iFlight Evoque and you can see quite a lot of dirt there on the outside. And of course, if those side plates weren't there, that dirt would be on the inside. The main thing that I think these side plates do is they give the quadcopter more of a feel like it is a finished consumer product and not a hobby product that someone has cobbled together. Here's another example of that. The LEDs on the side, yes, they are functional in a way. They indicate battery voltage. When the battery's fully charged, they're green. And if I turn down the voltage of my power supply here, we can see them go from orange to red. But also, they just make this look like a cool consumer product. And here's why I think this could be a good thing. FPV, if it wants to grow, it needs to become accessible to more of a mainstream audience. I know that not everybody agrees that that's actually a desirable goal. A lot of people feel like it would be better if FPV stayed small and if things like needing to know how to solder and set up a flight controller were a gateway that kept more casual people out. I'm not here to sort of engage with that argument. But if you feel like FPV needs to grow in order to survive, uh, then it needs to be more accessible and more appealing to people in the mainstream. And they are gonna really like a drone more like this, as opposed to something that looks more like a hobbyist soldered it together. But this does come with some downsides. Let's see how many screws I have to take out in order to like open this up and do some basic maintenance on it.
All right, that's eight screws, and now we can lift the top plate off and take a look at the insides. But even then, I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to work on this in its current state. Like, I could maybe get in here and solder wires to the top of the flight controller, and that's pretty much it. In order to get, really get in here, we have to take these side plates off. And that's going to involve, well, I am not sure exactly how many of these screws you have to remove to take the side plates off, but I can tell you that the original version of this that they sent me, the O3 Air unit actually didn't work. Not iFlight's fault. DJI's fault, apparently. But in trying to repair it, I took the side plates off and I broke one of them because I missed a screw. And it kind of couldn't figure out how to get it off and I kind of tugged on it the wrong way and it it's just kind of a level of, I feel dumb saying this, I was about to say a level of hassle that I'm not used to with FPV drones, which for anyone in FPV, the inherent hilarity of that statement should be obvious. I guess I should say it's a different kind of hassle. And it's the kind of hassle you get when what you're dealing with is a consumer product that has actually been carefully pieced together in a meaningful and thoughtful way instead of just slapped together. And yet still, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about it. The flight controller is the iFlight Blitz F722. It's got an F722 processor in there, as the name suggests. And that's not the absolute fastest that Betaflight runs today, but it's fast enough to run really anything that Betaflight asks of it. It does ship with Betaflight on it. If you wanted to do more autonomous flying, uh, Betaflight has very basic return to home. That's it. Uh, but if you wanted to do stuff like waypoint missions, loiter in place, altitude hold, and other GPS-assisted flight modes to kind of make it fly more like a DJI-style quad, the iNav firmware can do all of that stuff, and this flight controller can run iNav. We can't see it under there, but the ESC is the iFlight Blitz E55. That's a 55 amp ESC. And some people might be surprised to see a 55 amp ESC being used on a seven inch, seven and a half inch build, and the same 55 amp ESC being used on smaller five inch builds. There's two things going on there. One is that the seven inch build is usually tailored more towards cruising and efficiency than raw power. So you can actually find cases where the larger motors and larger props are actually drawing far less current than a smaller, faster quadcopter. The other thing going on here is that the ESCs we use in our smaller quadcopters, like five inches, oftentimes they're dramatically oversized for what our batteries can actually deliver. And it's nice to have that buffer, but it's not especially necessary, especially for more of a sort of a long range cruiser quad like this, that we're not gonna be just slamming the throttle all day long. So I think 55 amps is plenty. I'm sure iFlight got that right. I am always so impressed with iFlight's attention to detail. They build a damn good quadcopter. We've just got perfect solder joints here. There's so much thought put into this, uh, like the way this wire is run here to sort of keep it from getting snagged or whatever. I believe this is the GPS wire and it appears to have shielding on it. Uh, the GPS uh, got lock very, very quickly. It took about five minutes to get lock the first time I was at a new location. And then after that, it would lock within 30 seconds or a minute after power up. And it would easily get eight, 10, 12 satellites or even more. Once I think I saw 18 satellites, which I, I personally have never seen on a Betaflight quadcopter, mostly because the ones I usually fly are so small and, and it puts the GPS close to a bunch of electrical noise. This little guy here, what is this? I've never seen one of these on a quadcopter before, but I think I figured out what it is. So when you're running 6S batteries, and especially really big 6S batteries, you can get a great big spark or pop when you first plug the battery in. And it kind of freaks people out. They just don't like it. But also, it can cause scorching on your XT60 or in some cases even damage it. I think this must be the anti-spark device. You can get XT90 connectors with built-in anti-spark capabilities, but I don't think anybody makes an XT60 with anti-spark. I've looked for it before and wasn't able to find it. That is my guess as to what this is, and just another example of the kind of thought that iFlight puts into these builds. It's really hard to get an angle on this with the camera, but you can just see in here that iFlight have designed a bracket to hold the Air 3 air unit. Uh, and on the bottom of the bracket are some heat dissipation fins. There's a space all the way through the bottom of the frame. Uh, and when the props are spinning, air flows through there and keeps the O3 air unit cool. Now, don't get me wrong. If you are not flying, the O3 air unit will overheat. Uh, I remember one time when I had first, I had gone to a new city. So the GPS would do take a long time to get a lock. 
And before the GPS got locked, the air unit shut down because I wasn't flying. So it's still going to overheat, but it does mean that when you're flying and when the props are spinning, you're not going to have any issue with heat dissipation and these side plates are not going to be an issue. One thing that's extremely frustrating about this frame is that you can't see the LEDs on the O3 air unit. And that's partially DJI's fault because they stuck the LED like inside the unit. You could barely see it when the dang thing isn't inside a frame. But like, if you weren't sure if your air unit was powering up, you're like, you, it's just not working. Well, is it powering up? I don't know. You literally have to remove the frame plate or pull the O3 air unit out of the quad to get that diagnostic information. And it's a real, that's how I broke the side plate on mine, trying to just see the damn LED. iFlight has also redesigned the front of their frames to hold the O3 air unit camera. The O3 air unit camera is about 20 millimeters wide, whereas a standard FPV camera is about 19 millimeters wide. That was true for the previous generation DJI cameras as well, but the difference was that they had a normal sized lens so they could poke up between the front uh, standoffs and still work. The O3 camera is just as wide at its lens as it is at its body and requires a redesign of most frames in order to fit it. This is how iFlight have approached this. I like that they're using this 3D printed plastic insert to actually mount the camera. Uh, well, the first time that I saw it, I said, well, fine, it's got two screws. That's fine for the O3 camera, but what about all those cameras out there that only have one screw? How are they gonna mount? And clearly what iFlight intends is that they, they or you can swap this out with a different insert that has the appropriate screw holes for whatever camera you're gonna use. However, it doesn't give you a lot of flexibility in terms of the front to back mounting of the camera. One of the most important things to do with an FPV camera is have it just far, just far enough forward that you don't see the standoffs in view, but not so far forward that it protrudes outward and then it's more likely to get damaged in a crash. iFlight have designed this perfectly for the O3 camera and presumably all of their bind and flies will also have correct spacing. But if you were gonna buy one of these frames to do your own build, you might need to do just a little bit of adaptation to get the camera exactly where you want it. Uh, then again, on a seven inch, hopefully you're not gonna be smashing it in too many walls. The motors are iFlight Zing 2 2809 in 1250 kV. This is a special blacked out version that they put on the Chimera, but it's the same motor. And it has all the characteristics that make the Zing 2 motors so desirable. 7075 aluminum, the harder alloy of aluminum that's gonna be more durable. Uh, Unibel design, single piece bell for increased durability. Titanium motor shaft for lightweight and durability. 11 millimeter Japanese NSK bearings and a proprietary O-ring between the top bearing and the motor bell that helps absorb shock and vibration. The Brother Hobby 2806.5 motor was the first sort of standard seven inch motor. And there's an interesting question about how big a seven inch motor really needs to be because people run seven inch props on 2207, 2208 motors that you would normally associate with five inch quadcopters. The difference is that these bigger motors are gonna have more torque and more responsiveness, but more importantly, they're gonna run at a better place in their efficiency curve. You're actually gonna get more efficiency and longer flight times on these larger motors because they're better matched to larger props. Why is this fing GoPro turning off in the middle of every flight? What is going on, GoPro? No, your battery was fully charged, you Your battery was fully charged. Why is, uh... Now, as you get into proximity like this, the stakes get a lot higher. Let's just put it that way because this seven inch is not as nimble as a five inch. So if you run into trouble, then you're not gonna be able to react as quickly. And the props are a lot more fragile. Now these are the HQ 7.5 inch props, and maybe there are better ones out there. In fact, people have told me there definitely are better ones out there, but that's what I'm running. And I tapped a branch with one of these ones and it exploded and the quad crashed. It's, oh, oh, oh. Okay, got lucky on that one. It's a lot of fun to fly. There's something about the sort of inherent stability of a larger quad. Maybe it's that I know it's got more weight and I'm just flying it differently. Like even when I start to do a little sort of flippy flop stuff like that, I'm just more ginger with it. I'm more careful with it. 
Maybe it's that I know it costs $800 and if I crash it, it's gonna hurt to fix. But you can rip it. Oh, I'm gonna rip it a little. Let's rip it a little. It definitely doesn't drop as fast. Wow, really smooth. Did you hear any prop wash there? It definitely doesn't drop as fast as a five inch. Like here's a full throttle punch. Well, we're only at 3.6 volts. And here's how far it comes down at zero throttle. It drops a lot slower because of the drag of those seven and a half inch props. And it's really fun to do kind of flowy freestyle with this. You totally could do it. I'm impressed with the tune. We're really not seeing any prop wash oscillation. I mean, I could probably bring it out, but for a seven inch, it's pretty good. As we drop in here, no problem. Flies really nice. Just makes me want to swoosh around. Here I am at 3.5 second, uh, 3.5 volts, and you might think, oh well, the battery's done. But I can keep going for as long as I'm not jamming the throttle. Oh, hello. Well, good. Maybe it was just an unlucky fluke when I broke that prop because I've smacked a couple props now and haven't gone down. All righty, well, see, if this was a lithium ion pack, I could keep going all the way down to 3.0 volts. Only about six minutes there. That's a little shorter than I've been getting. I'm not sure why. While I'm charging up my battery for another go, let me show you a couple things iFlight have done with the flight controller configuration, some of which I like and some of which you'll see. The Betaflight Presets tab is probably one of the coolest and most useful things in Betaflight 4.3. Uh, it contains code snippets, little chunks of configuration that you can download and put on your flight controller. So you wanna download a PID tune? Well, you can just pick one and it'll automatically copy it down. But Betaflight doesn't just distribute their own code snippets. If we go to preset sources, you can add your own. So for example, I have a preset repo where I have presets that I use and I manage it. And here's one of the most awesome things ever done in all of FPV, iFlight has their own uh, preset repo. And the reason I say that's awesome is that so many people buy a bind and fly quadcopter and then like they mess around with the configuration or maybe they wipe the configuration uh, or they get a quadcopter that they bought from somebody else and they don't know what the configuration is and they wanna know how to get that configuration back to factory defaults. Usually that involves a lot of web searching and trying to find somewhere on the internet that someone has posted the config dump for the quad. And sometimes you find it and sometimes you don't. But iFlight putting these, putting all their configurations for all of their quadcopters in this preset repo means that it is so easy to return this to factory defaults if you ever screw it up or if they update it, if they update their PID tune and there's something you could do better. So I'm actually gonna do this right now. And now we are back at our factory settings. How freaking simple was that? Every manufacturer of bind and fly quads should do this. Maybe some of them have. If, they, if you have and I don't know about it, let me know. I would love to shout you out. If you want to take advantage of this, all you need to do is go in your Betaflight configurator to preset sources, hit add new source, and then type in the following. You can name it whatever you want. I just named mine iFlight Presets. And then the key thing is this URL needs to match and this GitHub branch needs to match. I'll put that stuff down in the video description so you can copy paste it if you're having a little trouble reading it or typing it. Now that we're back at factory defaults, here are some of the things that I like and dislike about this configuration. And the very first one is iFlight, what the F is going on with this OS? This is their factory default OSD. What is even happening here, iFlight? Like, was this designed for the original DJI goggles, which laid out the OSD a little weird and different? That's the only way I can make sense of this because as soon as you show it on the O3 air unit or if this was on analog, it just looks like a freaking mess. Yeesh, uh, enough said about that. 
iFlight ships all of their bind and fly quadcopters with angle mode activated permanently. You need to go into the modes tab and you need to change angle mode uh, if you want to fly in acro mode so that it is only activated when you have a switch in a certain position. And then you'll have a switch that turns angle mode on and off. I also noticed that, angle, uh, that iFlight doesn't activate many other common modes that you might want to use, including the beeper mode, which makes the motors go, or the beeper, it actually has a beeper on it. So it's kind of odd that it wasn't shipped with a beeper mode active. Uh, makes it go beep, beep, beep if you're trying to find it because you've crashed or landed somewhere, you don't know where it is. Uh, and another one that, well, I don't know about this one, but uh, the flip crash mode is used, it's also commonly known as turtle mode. And it's used to flip the quadcopter over if it's upside down after a crash. On the one hand, with these 7-inch props, they are not going to really stand up to a lot of, of thrashing around upside down. But on the other hand, if you did crash and your only option was to try to turtle mode out it to get home, you certainly want to have it. This is how I set up, well, this isn't exactly how I set up all my quads, but these are the four basic modes I have on basically all of my quads. And I don't, uh, I, I don't know, at least beeper mode, they could have shipped with it, right? Come on. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take this guy back outside and you're going to find out how it got dirt all over its nose. But before we do that, real quick, if at the end of this video you decide that this is a quadcopter you want to buy, there are links in the video description and they're not just there for your convenience. I mean, they're there for your convenience, but they're also there because they're affiliate links. And what that means is that when you click that link and then go to the store and make any purchase at the store, you can buy this, you can buy anything. Before you go shopping, find one of my affiliate links, click the affiliate link, go to the store, do all your shopping and check out, and I get a little commission. It doesn't cost you anything. Literally, only thing it costs you is the time to, you could just put, bookmark the links, it doesn't matter. It really means a lot. It's a small amount per purchase, but it adds up because you know, I'm, don't, I won't tell anybody, but you know you spend a lot on this hobby. So uh, yeah, give me a cut of that. Click my affiliate links. Well, okay, batteries are charged and we're gonna put it back up in the air and there's two things I wanna test. The first one is GPS rescue, like how well does that freaking work? And the second one is stabilization. The O3 air unit has built-in stabilization. It's turned on right now. And if the frame is transmitting too much vibration to the camera, then that stabilization won't work right. So let's see how it works. Alrighty, so we got 11 sats. That's more than enough satellites, 12 satellites. And the other thing we wanna double check before we hit GPS rescue is that the return to home arrow, the direction home arrow is pointing the right direction, which it is, and the altitude is kind of basically something that makes sense. It's not always exactly correct, but it's not like wildly off. We're gonna take it out here and we're gonna kick it in. There we go. What are we doing? We're climbing. We are coming home. Oh yeah, we're headed home, baby. Most sorta. Yeah, this is generally the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, we're here. When the lighting is good, this camera looks so freaking good. But as soon as there's like a wild difference in the lighting, like right now, then it looks, it's like so dark in spots. Let's give the stabilization a little bit of a work, workout, and do some flippy flops. You can flippy flop this guy if you want to. Not sure I'd recommend it. When you crash, not if, but when. It will not be a good time. Should we turn the rates up? Let's turn the rates up. Oh, that's faster. Oh, that's way faster. Still, even with the rates that high, it does not really want to rotate, does it? But it flies a little more like a freestyle quad. Oh gosh. Oh, it came over there. Man, the prop wash handling. I've had five inches that didn't have prop wash handling this good. This tune is really exceptional. These rates are a little too high for me, but I, I kind of wanted to make a point, see how fast it would spin. Because of the additional mass, it just won't spin as fast as a five inch, even if you try to make it do it. Uh, I mean, maybe it would get there, but it's just not as snappy. 
It's, this is fun though. I just don't feel as brave to like take risks. Because I know if I crash, it's gonna be expensive and and a difficult repair because of the complexity of the frame. Can we spang this? Can I spang anything? It gets up there, boy. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, okay. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> oh, battery's hanging in there. Ah! <laughs> well, let's take her inside and see what the damage is. It's uh, not as bad as I feared. Maybe I just got really unlucky with that one prop strike that just exploded the prop and made me crash. I bounced off of a couple branches out there and they didn't explode. Uh, as far as damage to the frame goes, there doesn't seem to be any. Uh, let's see. Arms are still pretty snug. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it was a pretty mild crash, right? So like, what would you expect? But still, you can get to these bigger quads. They get a little more fragile sometimes. We got a little dirt caked in here, but other than that, Seems like we're good to go. Just gotta double check and balance those props, am I right? Who is this quadcopter for? Like, who's really gonna love it? Because with an asking price for the bind and fly, with the O3 air unit, over $800, you really gotta want this to get into it. This quad's not really big enough to carry like a cinema camera, not even a smaller one like a Red Komodo or a Sony Z cam. Uh, and people who fly those tend to like to have octos for redundancy, although that's not always the case. You'd usually see something more like a 10 inch platform or something up from there. It seems like what a quad like this is really best at is like medium range cruising. Like you're gonna start at the bottom of a, maybe not like a whole mountain, but you're gonna start at the bottom of a mountain, you're gonna fly up to the top and you're gonna dive the ridge line down. You're gonna fly along the beach and just fly for what feels like forever, uh, you know, getting this nice long run. That kind of smooth, longer distance, longer ex uh, flight time flying seems like this where this is really going to excel. I also checked the specifications for this and it does seem like it would fit within the specs for Street League. If you're not familiar with that, Street League drone racing is a spec racing league where they build seven inch racing drones. I know, right? Seven inch racing drones, go figure. They build seven inch racing drones designed to have similar flight characteristics to like the DRL Racer 4. So if you've ever seen Drone Racing League and wanted to try that in real life, but of course you don't have a DRL Racer 4 and they won't let you into a DRL race, check out Street League. I'll put a link in the video description below. You know, another thing quadcopter like this might be good at is chasing vehicles. Five inch quadcopters are more than fast enough to chase a vehicle, but the problem is their short flight time. And something like this could have, that extended flight time might be just what the doctor ordered. You know, it reminds me of a time when I flew the Catalyst Machine Works nine inch Merica, and I chased uh, race cars around an oval track. If you missed that video, I'll put a link here, a card on screen, and you can go check it out. It was pretty freaking badass. We got kicked out after like three packs. Turns out we weren't supposed to be. I thought we had permission to be there. See you there. Link down below if you can't see the cards for some reason.